Welcome. In this session, we are going to discuss the lymphoproliferative and the histiocytic space occupying lesions in the orbit. And the lymphoproliferative lesions are a heterogeneous group of neoplasms. The individual entities being characterized by their histologic, immunologic, and genetic profiles. And they constitute 20% of all orbital tumors and usually present between 50 to 70 years of age. The individual entities can be any of a spectrum of disorders ranging from benign reactive hyperplasia to malignant lymphomas. The entities are clinically and radiologically similar in presentation but differ in histology and immunohistochemistry. The majority of the lymphoproliferative lesions are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and risks of NHL include older age, chronic exposure to chemicals and chronic autoimmune diseases. 98% are B-cell lymphomas, T-cell lymphomas are rare but are more lethal and Hodgkin's lymphoma rarely involves the orbit. One third of periocular lymphoid lesions have a history of previous or concurrent systemic lymphoma and another one third develop it over the next five years. The risk for systemic disease is maximum for eyelid lesions, moderate for orbital lesions and minimal for conjunctival lesions. Among the orbital lesion, risk is relatively higher for lesions in the lacrimal fossa, lacrimal fossa being the site of 50% of lymphoid lesions. Bilateral lesions markedly increase the systemic risk, but bilateral lesions per se do not imply systemic disease. Lymphoid lesions present with a painless, slowly growing mass with a firm rubbery consistency and the rate of growth depends on the grade of lymphoma. Orbital lymphomas can present with proptosis, globe displacement or ptosis. Conjunctival lymphomas appear as a salmon patch infiltrate as we see in this picture. And here in this picture we have a patient with lymphoma involving the eyelid. Lymphomas irrespective of grade tend to mold to surrounding structures instead of invading them and this molding is very characteristic of lymphomas. And because of this molding without invasion, visual and extraocular muscle dysfunction are uncommon with lymphoid lesions. Molding of the tumor to adjacent tissues is also seen on orbital imaging. Here we see an intraconal lymphoid lesion molding to the posterior aspect of the globe without indenting it. And lymphoid lesions are hypointense in T1 and hyperintense in T2 compared to muscles. Infiltration and bone erosion are unusual as we have described because of its molding nature, but infiltration and bone erosion can be found in high-grade lesions. 17% of lymphoid lesions have bilateral or bilateral involvement and as we have mentioned the risk of systemic malignancy increases with bilateral or bilateral involvement but bilateral or bilateral involvement per se does not indicate systemic disease. Tissue is obtained for biopsy and sent for histopathology, flow cytometry, immunohistochemistry and genetic studies. On histopathology, both benign as well as malignant lymphoproliferative lesions show hypercellularity with sparse stromal components. Benign lesions show follicular germinal centers and malignant lesions show anaplastic cells. Flow cytometry, immunohistochemistry and molecular genetic studies help us to establish the clonality of the tumor, clonality meaning whether all the tumor cells are arising from a single precursor cell. And 90% of lymphoid lesions have been found to be monoclonal and only 10% are polyclonal by molecular genetic studies. But both monoclonal and polyclonal lesions have been found to spread systemically, the monoclonal having a higher chance of systemic involvement. Flow cytometry, immunohistochemistry and molecular genetic studies can also tell us the lineage of the lesion whether they arise from a B-cell precursor or a T-cell precursor. Benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia or BRLH are composed histopathologically of small lymphocytes and plasma cells with mitotically active germinal centers and they are polyclonal and composed of both B and T cells. Whereas malignant lymphoma show large cells with large anaplastic nuclei, multiple nucleoli with absence of follicles. And malignant lymphomas are characteristically monoclonal and as we have mentioned of a predominantly B cell lineage. In order of their decreasing frequency, common types of malignant orbital lymphomas are extranodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma or EMZL, 
also called mucosa associated lymphoid tissue or malt lymphoma and they constitute 57 percent of all orbital lymphomas they are considered to be low grade and they have an increased expression of transcription factor nfk beta 10 percent of emzl have been found to regress spontaneously but 50 percent can spread systemically in 10 years time 20 percent of emzl can transform into a higher grade mostly large cell lymphoma 15% of all orbital lymphomas are diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL and they are considered to be high grade lesions and are associated with chromosomal alterations at multiple sites. And DLBCL can also occur intraocularly which we will be discussing when we discuss intraocular tumors. 11% of all orbital lymphomas are follicular lymphomas which are considered to be low grade and they are associated with translocation involving chromosomes 14 and 18 with overexpression of BCL2 which is an anti-apoptotic protein. Mantle cell lymphoma constitutes 8% of all orbital lymphomas and they are high grade lymphomas associated with translocation involving chromosomes 11 and 14 with overexpression of cyclin D1. Two other lymphoid lesions which need mentioning here are the Burkitt's lymphoma which is a very aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma which can occur in the orbit in children. Apart from Burkitt's lymphoma, other forms of lymphomas in the orbit are very rare in children. Burkitt's lymphoma is associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection, HIV infection and genetic defects in semic gene. Burkitt's lymphoma can have an endemic form which is found in Africa and occur among children and there is a sporadic form of Burkitt's lymphoma which occurs elsewhere in patients of any age. Plasma cell tumors are rare and they behave similarly to lymphoproliferative lesions and plasma cell tumors can be lymphoplasmacytic or composed of mature plasma cells or composed of immature plasma cells. They are considered to be high grade lesions and they show bone destruction on imaging. After biopsy of the lesion, a workup for systemic disease is essential when a diagnosis of an orbital lymphoid lesion has been made and the workup includes physical examination, complete blood count, serum immunoelectrophoresis, CT, MRI, PET scanning to look for involvement of other parts of the body and bone marrow biopsy. And even if this systemic workup is negative at initial diagnosis, it should be repeated periodically over a long period of time. Low-grade lymphomas such as EMZL and FL show a good response to radiotherapy and they do not respond well to chemotherapy. So if they have a systemic involvement and if they are asymptomatic, they are not usually treated as they have good long-term survival rates even without treatment. High-grade lymphomas such as DLBCL and MCL respond poorly to radiotherapy alone and they show a good response when chemotherapy and immunotherapy is administered along with local radiotherapy. Histiocytic disorders can arise from either Langerhans cell histiocytes or non-Langerhans cell histiocytes when it is called xanthogranulomas. Langerhans cell histiocytosis LCH and previously called histiocytosis X originates from the mononuclear phagocytic system and they consist of proliferating dendritic Langerhans histiocytes often in the bone. They vary from benign lesions which may spontaneously resolve to lesions which disseminate systemically and the peak age of presentation is 5 to 10 years. 5 year survival rate is 50% when the disease onset is before 2 years of age and is 87% when the disease onset is after 2 years of age. And several types of LCH has been described and these variants were previously termed eosinophilic granuloma, Hans-Schuller Christian disease and lateral CV disease. The current classification includes unifocal eosinophilic granuloma of bone which is localized and benign and occurs in childhood or adolescence. Then there is the multifocal eosinophilic granuloma of bone which is aggressive and presents in a younger age group between 2 to 5 years of age and these patients can have pituitary dysfunction. The diffuse soft tissue histiocytosis variant of LCH is the most aggressive with worst prognosis 
and they usually involve the viscera instead of the bone and liver and spleen are particularly involved and they present in a much younger age group before 2 years of age but they rarely involve the eye. So we are mostly concerned with the LCH variants involving the bone. LCH presents with an orbital mass lesion along with signs of orbital inflammation. The mass lesion can cause a rapidly progressing painful proptosis and signs of orbital inflammation such as swelling and chemosis is more frequent in younger children and it can be mistaken for orbital cellulitis. Imaging shows a sharply demarcated lytic bone lesion best seen on CT scan. As we see here, there is bilateral involvement of the inferolateral orbital one. But they usually affect the suprotemporal orbital rim or the greater wing of the sphenoid. They show irregular margins along with marginal hyperostosis as seen here. On imaging LCH can also show spread to the intracranial space. The associated soft tissue inflammation is best seen on MRI. On biopsy, we find a soft, friable, tan yellow colored tumor having foamy histiocytes which have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and irregular nuclei. On electron microscopy, we find tennis racket shaped Birbeck granules in the cytoplasm of these foamy histiocytes, as we see in this electron micrograph. In addition to foamy histiocytes, Eosinophils and giant cells are also found and tumor tissue is immunohistochemically positive for CD1A as well as S100. Following diagnosis of LCH on biopsy, a workup for systemic disease is warranted and this workup needs to be repeated periodically. Treatment options include debulking, steroid injection and or radiotherapy for localized lesions, chemotherapy for systemic involvement and lytic bone lesions of Langerhansel histiocytosis can reossify after treatment. Xanthogranulomatosis arises from non-Langerhansel histiocytes and they occur in an adult form which can involve the orbit and a juvenile form which involves the eye. So they originate from non-Langerhansel histiocytes and are characterized by foamy macrophages and tauton giant cells. We see here a picture of a tauton giant cell in which there is a ring of multiple nuclei which surround a central homogeneous cytoplasm and the peripheral cytoplasm appears foamy. These non langer cell histiocytes are immunohistochemically positive for LN3 and KIM1P. Four types of adult xanthogranulomatous disease can affect the orbit and they are differentiated based on their systemic manifestations. They cannot be differentiated based on histopathology. In order of decreasing frequency, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma or NBX is the most common and they present with subcutaneous lesions throughout the body which are prone to ulceration and fibrosis. NBX is associated with paraproteinemia and multiple myeloma. Adult asthma and periocular xanthogranuloma or AAPOX is associated with asthma lymphadenopathy and raised immunoglobulin G in the serum. erdheim chester disease or ECD has the poorest prognosis and is often fatal and it is characterized by a severe recalcitrant dense fibrosclerosis of the orbit along with that of the pericardium, pleura and retroperitoneum. Adult onset xanthogranuloma or AOX is the least common and does not have any systemic involvement. AOX, AAPOX and NBX affect eyelids and the anterior orbit and present with swelling, erythema and yellowish discoloration of the eyelids. AOX and AAPOX are usually bilateral and symmetric. erdheim chester disease affects the posterior orbit bilaterally and symmetrically and can cause loss of vision. Juvenile form of xanthogranuloma is also a proliferation of non langer cell histiocytes and also have foamy histiocytes and tauton giant cells. But instead of the orbit, it involves the iris inside the eye. Thank you for listening.